This is the first of three videos about power law degree distributions in networks. This video explains the basics of power law distributions and gives some real world examples of power law data. Our next video will talk about the scale free property of power law networks, and our final video will discuss some of the best practices around fitting power laws to data. Now, if I asked you to draw a probability distribution, then you'd probably sketch a curve similar to one of these. It would be roughly bell-shaped and centered around its average value. So you can imagine the surprise when researchers started looking at the degree distributions for real-world networks. Instead of seeing a nice bell-shaped curve like this green one, they instead saw this purple curve. For this purple degree distribution, the vast majority of vertices have degrees that are very, very small. Meanwhile, there are some very high degree vertices in comparison with the others. And here are two networks that capture the difference between these degree distributions. The green network corresponds to the green bell-shaped curve, and the purple network corresponds to the other curve we see. The vertices here are sized by degree, and this is a nice use of data visualization to help us to tell our story. In the green network and its corresponding green bell-shaped curve, there is some variation in the degrees, but they span a very narrow range of values. When we look at the purple network, we see many vertices with degree zero or one, but there are also lots of high degree vertices, and they actually seem to dominate the infrastructure of the network. We also see a wide range of values among these high degree vertices. The log log plot of the green curve takes a nosedive. This means that the degrees are restricted to a particular small interval. On the other hand, the purple curve turns into a line with negative slope. This curve doesn't take a nosedive, which means that there are some extremely high degree vertices. And in fact, the straight line that we see in the log log plot suggests that we might be looking at what is known as a power law distribution. Now, when we look at the original purple curve here on the left, it might remind you of the function y equals e to the minus x. But the log log plot reveals the truth. The purple curve decays much more slowly than an exponentially decaying distribution. Let's see why this is the case. In this slide, the blue curve comes from the same family of distributions as the purple curve on the previous slide. We can tell because in the log log plot, we get this characteristic straight line with a negative slope. This straight line in the log log plot tells us that the distribution must be proportional to minus alpha times k. The green curve on the left is a probability distribution that decays exponentially. So the probability is proportional to e to the minus a k for some constant a. In the log log plot, the exponential decay leads to a nosedive in the green curve. This exponential decay prevents you from having ultra high degree vertices. Their probability is so astronomically low that they cannot happen. In comparison, the blue curve decays much, much more slowly, and this allows us to have some high degree vertices. So here is the general formula for the probability mass function of a power law degree distribution. Given a huge network, we pick a vertex uniformly at random, and we look at its degree. The probability that this vertex has degree k is proportional to k raised to the negative alpha, where alpha is some fixed number that is greater than 1. Now we must multiply the k to the minus alpha term by some normalizing constant c. This is because the probabilities have to sum to 1 in order for this to be a probability mass function. Now note that low degree vertices are much more likely than higher degree vertices. For example, 1 over 2 to the alpha is going to be much, much bigger than 1 over 10 to the alpha. This power law degree distribution decays slow enough that we will actually see some very high degree vertices. They are less common, but they do appear in the network, and they act as major hubs to the network structure. Let's talk about why a power law distribution looks like a straight line when we create a log log plot. Here we are using p sub k to denote the probability that a randomly chosen vertex has degree k. Our power law can then be expressed as pk equals c times k to the minus alpha. 
So let's take the logarithm of both sides. The result is actually a linear relationship between log of k and log of p of k. The slope of this linear relationship is minus alpha, and this is our power law exponent. So this means that if I plot log of k versus log of p of k, I will get a straight line with a negative slope. And a bigger alpha corresponds to a steeper negative slope in this log-log plot. The World Wide Web is an example of a network whose degree distributions look like power laws. In this network, we join two web pages by a directed edge when one of them links to the other. These two figures show the log-log plots for the in-degree and the out-degree distributions. You can see that the data suggest a straight line fit might be appropriate. So this means that we would be fitting a power law to each of the data sets. Also, we note that the power law exponent is different for the in-degree versus the out-degree. For in-degree, the exponent is 2.09. For the out-degree, the exponent is 2.72. As a consequence, the in-degree hubs will be bigger than the out-degree hubs in this network. This is because the decay rate for in-degree is slower than the decay rate for out-degree. And this makes intuitive sense. A great web page gathers lots of in-links over time from many other web pages with various authors. Meanwhile, when a web page has lots of outlinks, it is from the effort of a single author, and that's a lot of work for one person. So websites with large out degree should be less common than websites with large in degree. Now power laws appear in other settings besides networks. For example, the populations of cities around the world adhere to a power law. Cities with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of residents are pretty common, but there are also some mega metropolises for example, the Tokyo urban area has a population of over 37 million, and Jakarta has more than 34 million. New York City is only the 11th largest urban area, with 28 million people. About 10 years ago, researchers found that the best fitting power law for the current city populations adhered to a power law using alpha is equal to 2.37. And there are many more data sets that seem to follow a power law. For example, the log log plots on this slide show the word frequencies in the novel Moby Dick, the vertex degrees in a yeast protein interaction network, the vertex degrees of a metabolic network for a bacterium, the physical structure of internet routers, the number of daily phone calls received by AT&T customers, and finally, the number of battle deaths in warring nations. Here we list the power law exponents for all of the examples we have talked about today. Looking at these numbers, we realize that the value of the exponent alpha is quite narrow. For the most part, alpha seems to range between 2 and 3. In today's class activity, we will discover what makes this range particularly special. And this will provide evidence that this natural power law range allows these complex systems to thrive. To get a sense of the difference between a Poisson or bell-shaped everyday network and a power law network, let's compare two transportation networks. The first is the interstate highway system in the U.S., and the second is the airline route map connecting those same cities. Pause the video and think about why these networks look so different. What are the factors that went into their design? What are their constraints? And what are their objectives? Both the highway network and the airline network have the same goal, to allow people to move efficiently through the United States. But the highway network has a very different set of constraints than an airline network. In particular, topography is probably the biggest constraint. We couldn't possibly have one city with many, many highways converging. There simply isn't the physical space to build them. Plus, the sheer number of cars would create too much congestion. Airline route maps don't have this constraint. But they also have another goal in mind, profit for the airlines. People do want to be able to move around the country easily, but the airlines themselves want to make efficient use of their air fleet. In other words, they want their airplanes to fly near capacity to cover their overhead. Therefore, airlines don't provide direct flights between every pair of cities. Instead, they make use of hub airports to increase efficiency. In other words, having a few airports with very high degree creates an ideal design to maximize the overall flow of travelers. Let's spend a little more time looking at this nice data visualization, which fills the area under the probability mass function with vertices of the appropriate degree. We can see that in a Poisson network, all of the degrees are about the same. 
In other words, they are concentrated near the mean value of this distribution. Another way of saying this is that there is a particular scale for the vertex degrees. On the other hand, the vertex degrees in a power law network are quite different. The vast majority of vertices are very low degree, but these are complemented by some hub vertices which have very high degree. Moreover, these hub vertices have diverse degrees when compared to one another. We have hubs and mega hubs and mega mega hubs and so on. This broad spread of values mean that there isn't a characteristic scale for vertex degrees in a power law network. They are spread far and wide. This concludes our introduction to power laws. In a power law, the probability of a vertex of degree k is c times k to the minus alpha. The constant alpha is the power law exponent. It captures the rate of decay of the power law. c is a normalizing constant so that the probabilities all add up to 1. In today's activity, we will address the following topics. First, we will figure out how to find the normalizing constant for a given power law. Second, we will look into a, approximating a power law with a continuous distribution. Finally, we will tackle the big question. Why is it that natural power laws have exponents between 2 and 3? What is so special about this range? And what behavior does this allow that is actually helpful for organizing a complex system?